Thank you. Yes, you are. <laughs> so, good morning. <laughs> I wanted to look at this idea today of our intentions and actions, and when sometimes maybe our actions don't match our inner intentions, like to be part of a nice quiet meditation group and forgetting to turn off our cell phone. But, um, <laughs> just kind of popped into my mind. <laughs> you know, there's this old saying that I don't know if you've heard before, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I never liked that saying. And those of us in Science of Mind and other New Thought teachings can sit back and maybe be a little bit smug as we let people know that, well, we don't really believe in that traditional idea of hell. And then being highly evolved beings that we are, we might want to throw in a little ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get clear about this. You know, we don't believe in the tra traditional ideas of heaven and hell as being places that we go for all eternity, especially about this one of eternal damnation from which we can never recover. However, we do believe in the concept of heaven and hell as states of consciousness that we can experience. You know, we experience heaven when we feel our oneness with that presence of God that we say is in through and as all creation that lives in us, when we feel one with that, we are experiencing a heavenly experience on earth. And when we feel separate and that feeling of fear and other you know, negative emotions and experiences that arise out of that, we are experiencing hell. So we do believe that we can always transcend that experience of hell because God is still there for us to uh, call forth from within ourselves to find a way to make good of what is. But if we go with that idea of hell as being a temporary state of unhappiness or suffering that we can transcend from, could our good intentions lead to negative or hellish experiences. Let me ask it this way, and you don't have to raise your hand, but has anyone had the greatest, noblest intentions for some really great experience to be made and manifest that we move forward and we just stay gung-ho about getting it to come forth, and then when it does, it's absolutely nothing like what we originally intended. Maybe there were things we didn't consider and it's absolutely disastrous. Well, again, the good news in Science of Mind is that even if that happens, that God nature in us is there for us to make good of whatever negativity we've brought forth intending to experience something good. But I think we would all agree that if we could circumvent the negative experience and the suffering, that would be the way to go. And so what I want us to be clear about is, first of all, all intentions originate as good intentions. Because what we say is God is present in everything and everyone, including us, and that nature of God is for its goodness to be felt and experienced and expressed throughout creation. So we always feel the impulse of God to feel good, to experience goodness. But because we're all evolving and we're not fully awakened to this idea that we are one with God, that God is in everything and everyone, including us, then we have feelings of separation. We have limited thinking such as, well, Maybe the idea of my good versus your good, because I'm feeling a sense of me separate from you. We've seen what kind of experiences that can create in the world, right? Or it has to be this way. This is the only way that I can experience goodness. Or 
Oh, that's just completely impossible. And that will never be able to show up in this way. So we go down some other pathway. So no matter how much we may be driven by that impulse of God to experience goodness in some way, and we grasp ideas of how to experience that in our lives, we need to peri peri periodically, thank you, <laughs> check if our finite ideas of the good that we want to experience really are aligned with that divine nature in us seeking to fulfill itself through us. So years ago, I remember seeing a Saturday Night Live skit uh, about a credit card commercial that I think really exemplified how this intention to do something good can sometimes not quite work out the way it was originally intended. And so I tried to recreate this to the best of my ability. And thanks to practitioner extraordinaire, board member, and actor Jeffrey Paul Whitman. <laughs> we would like to try to recreate this for you. I was sitting at home one evening, relaxing, when I was interrupted by a phone call from my credit card company. At first, I thought it was going to be one of those dreaded telemarketing calls. But to my surprise, the representative reassured me that he wasn't calling to sell me anything. He informed me that he'd noticed some unusual charges on my credit card, and he wanted to alert me to them right away. He sounded genuinely concerned. It's my company's goal to give personal quality service to each and every one of our customers. I'm very committed to that goal, which is probably why I've received many service awards, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, I like to treat each of my accounts as if it were my own. In reviewing his account, I noticed some charges to some very expensive men's clothing stores that didn't match any of his prior spending habits. I thought I'd better make him aware of this issue right away, so I called him at home. I was genuinely concerned. I was so impressed by the level of service that his company was providing, and I let him know it. But then, in hearing what the charges were for, I reassured him that they were valid. I had indeed made those purchases recently. I explained to him that the issue wasn't whether or not he had made the charges. My concern was that he'd never needed to spend his money on these types of fancy clothes before. <laughs> so he certainly didn't need to start doing so now. After all, if we start getting careless with the way we spend our money, it can have very serious consequences down the line. I was genuinely concerned. Quite frankly, I was really taken aback. I let him know that I didn't think it was for him to be telling me how I should be spending my own money. And even if it were, I explained to him that those charges were for some very nice cashmere sweaters that I'd sent to my dad in Kansas City. He'd been feeling under the weather lately, and I knew that he'd really appreciate these gifts. It was my way of showing him that I love him and that I was thinking about him. I told him that was very sweet and touching, but I wasn't buying any of it. I reminded him that I'd been keeping a careful watch over his account, and at no point in the past two years had I seen a single charge for a plane ticket to Kansas City. If he loved his father so much, wouldn't it be a good idea to actually visit him once in a while? I was genuinely concerned. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I let him know that I'd be sending a complaint letter to his boss 
and that I'd be closing my account. Thank you very much. I told him to not get his panties in a bunch. And I... Hello? Hello? Please don't take away my service awards. I'm genuinely concerned. <laughs> Isn't it a shame that we never have any fun here? <laughs> so what happened? Okay. The impulse of love, of God's love, to fulfill itself, that spirit is always seeking to give of itself unto itself, showed up as this idea of a way to be of service that this company had come up with. The representative obviously took it a little bit beyond the scope of the original idea, lost sight of the original intention and whether or not his actions supported those intentions. So can it be with each of us? Hopefully not in quite so dramatic a fashion, but you know, we feel the impulse of God's infinite love, joy, abundance, wholeness, seeking to be experienced and expressed through us, and we grasp finite ideas of how that might take shape in our lives, you know, as that, that relationship in this form, that career that might show up in this way and that we should go for, or that project that would give us so much satisfaction and fulfillment. But as we move forward toward a finite object objective, I think it's necessary for us to pause, to step back and contemplate, see if our actions are still in alignment with our original intentions. Now, Reverend Wayne Muller, author of Sabbath, showed great humility, I believe, when he shared a story of a project that he was involved with. You know, years back, he was part of an organization that realized that there were a lot of people locked up in mental institutions who really didn't belong there. He said, you know, they had some kind of mental disability which might prevent them from functioning totally effectively in the world on their own, but that they weren't really a danger to others or to themselves, and they certainly didn't belong in an institution locked behind closed doors, and so, this organization did a lot of work to make sure these people would be released. And he said, we move forward and move forward. And they were so gung-ho about this goal that he said, none of us paused, none of us stepped back to consider when we release these people, do they have somewhere to go? Which in the end contributed to the problem of so many people being homeless. And he admitted, he said, you know, the intention was good. There was nothing bad about it. It showed great compassion for those who were unnecessarily locked up. But in moving forward with the goal and not stepping back periodically, the end, end product really didn't match the deeper spiritual intention behind it. And you know, I think this idea of stepping back, of getting still, of just seeing if where we're going matches where we really want to go is maybe a little bit more difficult for those of us in the Western world where we're so goal-oriented and go for it no matter what. You know, uh, Dr. Ahmed Goswami, who's a quantum physicist and who taught some of the quantum physics classes that we took in ministerial school, talked about this idea that having been from India but now working in the Western world, he said, you know, in the Eastern part of the world, people are a lot better about just being, just being in the moment, not always being so driven. In the Western world, we're much more about doing, getting things done. And he said, none of it is bad. He said, you know, certainly it's great, all the wonderful things that have come out of people's initiative to create. But he said, we really need a balance of the two. And he offered the idea that the ideal way to be in the world was given to us by Frank Sinatra when he said, 
do be do be do <laughs> I give Dr. Kaswami full credit for that one. <laughs> but how do we get there? How do we get to that place? You know, where there's greater balance between these two and once again, you're going to hear us say it from the pulpit, it all has to do with our spiritual practice. It all has to do with us taking time on a regular basis to commune with that presence, to feel that essence of the divine that lives in us. When we are turning to it, reminding ourselves of that spiritual vibration, we're more likely to notice when our actions are out of alignment with it. And particularly, particularly the practice of meditation is the one that helps to build that muscle. And it's, of course, the one we resist the most. Why? Because in meditation, we're just being. We're not doing anything from our perception. But it builds that muscle for us to observe when something feels out of alignment, when something feels uncomfortable. Because that's another thing we really don't like in our culture, right, is any kind of discomfort or pain. We want to just, you know, put that aside, not have to deal with it. We don't want to feel it. But through meditation, when we can allow ourselves to just sit and observe and see even the discomfortable, the uncomfortable, the discomfort that is there, what is coming up, and try to identify what's it about. You know, why am I not feeling that essence of joy or wholeness or fulfillment that I thought I was going to be feeling through moving in this direction, we can then realign with the truth. We can realign with that vibration and see what we need to do to make good of where we are at the moment. And I, great, great, great example that was shared with me years back uh, from someone that was in our teaching a man who had really not been very wise in his use of money. He had been a bit of a spendthrift. His sense of lack made him overspend. And he realized that. And doing work in our teaching, he realized, OK, I want to become a good steward. I want to master this quality of good stewardship, which is a spiritual vibration. And to feel greater security and prosperity, plentifulness. And so that drove him to get a better job, start making more money, make more wiser use of his money. And very soon, he found that he and his family were in a much, much better position financially. But as his finances improved dramatically, he noticed that there was something in him that still felt uneasy. And through this practice of meditation, as he really watched what this was about, he realized that he had lost sight of the idea that, you know, that sense of plentifulness, of abundance, of security, doesn't just come from financial well-being. That it isn't all about material possessions and what we have. That he had really lost sight of that sense of plentifulness in the love in his relationships. He had abandoned or ignored many of his relationships. And that caused him to look for ways to create more balance in his life, to spend more time with his family, with friends. And he said he was never so grateful for having awakened to that than when years down the road, his 12-year-old daughter was diagnosed with cancer. And he said the fact that he had taken time to cultivate those relationships, he said it was amazing the amount of support that he and his family received at that time. Also, he said, I realized right then that no matter where things went, I would not be one of those dads that was sorry that he had not spent more time with his daughter. Now, thankfully, she, uh, the treatments worked, and she is today a cancer survivor. But the deeper, deeper lesson to him was to really pay attention when that voice within was saying, something's out of alignment here. 
Now, how often do we ignore or suppress the signals that are telling us how our drive for some specific idea of goodness is out of alignment with that part of us that is just seeking that greater experience of well-being and wholeness and peace? When we're ignoring that voice that says, you want more love in your life? How are you showing up? Are you being loving? Is that the way you're going to go about getting love, just going after that type of relationship? How about that voice that says, really, you want to be at peace, and yet you're not willing to forgive or let go of your resentments? Or that voice that's telling us, maybe loving also means loving yourself. How will you ever feel good if you don't also care for yourself? You know, as we feel the calling of spirit to move through us for the, from the realm of the infinite invisible to the finite visible, it's important to keep aligning with the vibration, with the inner feeling of it. The more we do, the more we remain open to all the various forms it can take so that we can recognize if a certain form isn't going to serve us, that we can go in a different direction. And the more we do our work in consciousness to see if our outer actions are in alignment with the inner calling of spirit to fulfill itself through us, the more likely we are to pave the pathways that lead to heavenly versus what we would label as hellish experiences here on Earth. You know, let's remember, no matter how far we may go off track, God is still there. There's still goodness to be called forth. There's a way to make good of any situation to move us back on the pathway where we can experience good again. But the more we stay aligned, the more we check in regularly, the more likely we are to correct ourselves before we get, go way too far down that pathway that's harder to recover from. Are you with me on that? Yes. OK, then let's pray. So as we turn our attention inward, in this moment, allowing ourselves to feel that impulse of the divine, that one life, that one presence, that one all goodness that I call God, and how it forever is there seeking and experience and expression of its goodness through us. I absolutely know that we are filled and surrounded by this essence of God's nature, and that it lives in us as a presence that will show us, if we open to it, the way for its goodness to be more fully realized and recognized through us. And so I speak the word knowing that if there's any area where we are clinging to an idea that does not support the deeper intention of spirit for a greater experience of its nature in our lives, that we now let that go, that we open to that absolute perfect outer experience in our lives that matches the vibration of God's love, of God's joy, of God's abundance and health and wholeness. It guides us. It shows us the way. I know that we are blessed in coming together today. And I know that this prayer is a prayer for all those who may be feeling out of alignment as we know that God is right there to show them the way into that greater experience of good. We bless our church, we bless all churches, synagogues, temples, God, ashrams, all paths to God. And with a full, full and grateful heart, knowing that God is always in and around all that is, I release this word, knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. Together we say, Amen. Amen.